We're speaking today with Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, a COVID-19 technical lead at the World Health Organization. She's an infectious disease epidemiologist at the WHO Health uh, Emergency Program. Dr. Van Kerkhove is the head of emerging diseases and zoonosis at the World Health Organization. She served there for more than 12 years, battling MERS, Ebola, influenza, yellow fever, and Zika as well. Dr. Van Kerkhove, thank you so much for joining us today on Conversations on Healthcare. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. You know, we just uh, marked a, a, a milestone in the pandemic. More glo global COVID-19 cases were reported in, in the past two weeks than during the first six months of the outbreak. Margaret, I think maybe millstone is a better word than yeah. milestone, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could just tell our listeners about the crisis in India and other regions of concern that are really driving these current numbers. Yeah, well, first, thanks, thanks for having me on, on the program and, and for reaching out to ask these really important questions. The global situation is really fragile that we're seeing right now. The, the numbers of cases that are being reported, which are clearly an underestimate of the true number of infections that are actually happening worldwide, um, are at some of the highest levels we've seen since the start of this pandemic. Um, last week alone, there were 5.4 million cases reported. The week before, 5.7 million cases. The week before that, 5.7 million cases. We should not be in a situation like this 17 months into a pandemic. Um, there are uh, worrying countries, hot spots in every single region of the planet. Um, right now, you are hearing a lot about the incredibly challenging situation that we are seeing in India. Um, but don't forget, you know, we have had really uh, horrific outbreaks in Brazil, and they're still coming out of these outbreaks. Um, the countries in the southern cone of the, the southern uh, South America are having some increasing in tr transmission. There are countries across Europe in the eastern part of Europe that are seeing very worrying trends across the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, Egypt, um, even in Africa, I mean, in, 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 in Southeast Asia, they're at different levels of intensity of transmission around the world. It's very hard to give a short answer to this question because the intensity is so different. Mm -hmm. um, the situation in India, uh, where we've seen a really rapid increase in cases, um, but even at the subnational level, the same, um, there are differences at the subnational level. Yeah. Um, there are common factors that we have seen in increases. Number one um, is that we have now seen the emergence of these virus variants. Um, and many of these virus variants, we have now have four variants of concern um, that we are tracking globally. All of these variants of concern have demonstrated increased transmissibility. And if you have increased transmissibility, it means more people can be infected. They have mutations that, for example, allow the virus to, to bind to the cell more easily and infect the cell. If you have more cases, you will have more hospitalizations. If you have more hospitalizations, you will have more deaths. And in situations where hospitals are already overburdened, you will see that be reflected in morbidity and mortality. Mm -hmm. wow. The other challenging factor is 17 months in, we are all tired. We're sick and tired of this virus and we want it to be over. Yeah. But this virus is not done with us yet. So adhering to public health and social measures, you know, really having cohesive, consistent use of them um, becomes quite challenging. And in many parts of the world, they're not applied consistently or coherently or um, for a long enough period of time. Mm -hmm. And the last challenge is uneven and e inequitable vaccine distribution. Mm -hmm. So this combination of factors is really dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, this combination of factors is affecting all of us, even in countries that have controlled COVID remain at risk because you know when all of us, any of us are at risk, all of us are at risk. And these challenges pose some uncertainties going ahead. Well, Dr. Van Kerkhove, thank you for putting that focus on it and uh, certainly brings us back to the uh, first months of the pandemic mm -hmm. here in the United States and just the enormous uh, stress of there aren't going to be enough ventilators, there's not going to be enough uh, ICU beds, there's not going to be enough personal protective equipment, and that's multiplied thousands of times over when we look at a country and a population the size of India. I think the whole country has learned much more this year about public health for sure, but also about the work of the World Health Organization. And I'm, I'm curious, I, you know, I think we tend to think of uh, the World Health Organization in terms of policies and interventions, but what is the organization able to do in terms of marshalling resources and getting them to these hardest 
hit countries. We certainly read about the lack of oxygen mm -hmm. canisters or the ability to deliver uh, oxygen along with, of course, the vaccines. But what, what can the World Health Organization do? How are you marshalling resources around the world to try and help these countries that are experiencing their worst moments ever right now? Well, it's a great question. I mean, you know, as you first point out, you know, saying what we've learned, that is something I should have said in my first answer. While we are having a, a huge number of cases being reported worldwide, we know a lot more about this virus 17 months in. So we're not in the same position. Mm -hmm. With regards to supplies, I mean, one of the things that WHO does is we develop the, we, we're a member state organization. You know, we work with everyone everywhere around the planet. Um, we develop the norms and standards around what needs to be done in terms of guidance, how to use some of these supplies like personal protective equipment, like oxygen and safe oxygen use, different types of therapeutics. Um, and we work with partners around the world to ensure that those materials are received where they are needed. Um, part of this, and in the beginning of the pandemic, we really struggled with supply. I'm sure you can recall back oh, to the yeah. early days when we were thinking about even just medical masks. Yep. Medical masks did not, in enough quantity, did not exist. Right. Um, and we worked with many partners around the world to, to increase production. Um, and you can, you can swap out masks with respirators. You can swap out respirators with O2 canisters. And if you think of all of this tiny little materials that it would be required to actually use oxygen for mm -hmm. someone, and you think of the tubes that are necessary to actually administer that oxygen to someone, all of that needs to be sourced. All of that needs to be supplied. So we work with people around the world. We work with institutions around the world, member states around the world. We work with agencies that help us not only increase that capacity to set up that global supply chain um, that was really broken in the beginning of this pandemic. We're still working to fix. A huge amount of work has been done to do that. And we do that with partners with UNDP, with UNICEF, with Chai Foundation, with I'm gonna, I, I shouldn't list any or, yeah, any organizations sure, because sure. I will inadvertently forget. Of course. But um, many, and and, ab and it's about getting them to where they are, where they are needed most. Mm -hmm. um, and if you also remember in the beginning of the pandemic, um, there were no flights. So actually right. working with um, uh, WFP uh, and, and getting planes to be able to hmm. put materials on those planes, get those planes, into the countries that are necessary. We have a hub in Dubai um, with a lot of the supplies and making sure that that is stocked so that it's easily accessible to where they are needed. But it is about, it's a massive chessboard. Yeah. Um, it's a massive chessboard of where right. supplies are needed. And if you think now, one of the things we're telling all countries to do now is to surge your capacities. Right. We've been saying this and I'm right. accused of being a broken record and I will continue to be, but surge your capacities now build that infrastructure from surveillance activities through your testing, making sure you have the right supplies, um, making sure you have a community workforce that could do contact tracing, make sure that your health workers have some rest period, you know, in some kind of rotation, um, make sure that your hospital facilities are prepared because not only is this critical for COVID, it will be critical for the next one. And I'm afraid there will be a next one. Mm -hmm. So we need countries to learn from this trauma that we're in right now to build and surge those capacities, mm -hmm. not after it's over, right. because we will move on to the next problem. It needs to happen now. And we have the attention, we have the political will. Um, and in many respects, we have a lot of finances that can be used for this. We need to build that now. Mm -hmm. Well, that's such a great piece of advice and really sort of a backstage look at the logistics required, the supply chain and all of those. And, and hopefully people are heeding, uh, heeding that advice uh, because uh, we are not going to be done with this for a while. And, and I, you know, don't know where we're headed in terms of these variants. Uh, certainly, I think here in the States, when anybody hears a variant, they're worried about uh, does my vaccine uh, protect me from it? And you were talking about a, a couple that you, uh, were on your eyes in the, in the World Health Organization just uh, declared the B1617 uh, a, a variant of concern, which is, which is part of that uh, group of uh, three or four that you had mentioned earlier. I, I'm wondering how we should be thinking about these variants, of just trying to get our conceptual mind around, uh, you know, the lethality and transmissibility, 
um, and also the efficacy of of the four, I, three or four vaccines that are out there. And you have a unique understanding of how variants could change the trajectory of the pandemic as a specialist in emerging threats. Uh, what's most concerning about the latest variants? And it probably won't be the last variant that we hear about, but it's the one that uh, is currently on everyone's mind. Yeah, um, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, viruses evolve, viruses mutate, they change. This is completely expected. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it depends on who I'm talking to, who I'm giving this answer to right now. If I'm talking to the general public, if I'm talking to my family at home, my husband, my child, yep. all SARS-CoV-2 viruses are dangerous. We need to do everything we can to protect ourselves from getting infected, prevent us from spreading it if we're infected, and do everything we can for those who are infected to ensure that they don't progress to severe disease and death. It doesn't matter if it's a virus, a variant, a variant of concern, whatever you want to call it, all of them are dangerous. What we are looking at specifically when we're looking at mutations is to track these mutations, which ones are important and why. And so from the beginning, the virus has been changing. And again, it's expected. Um, you know, around the, the new year, we started to see some variants emerge, um, which are classified now as variants of concern. We have the B117 that was first identified in the UK, the B1351 first identified in South Africa, the P1, which was first identified in Japan from travelers from Brazil, and we now have the B617. What we are looking for in these variants of, is there any demonstration of a change in the way the virus behaves? Is it more transmissible and why? Does it cause any differences in, in disease presentation or severity, which would change our countermeasures, our medical countermeasures? Does it evade, does it render our diagnostics, our therapeutics and our vaccines ineffective? That's what we're really looking mm -hmm. for. So for us as an agency, we're working with partners around the world to track these changes. We need good sequencing so that we have good eyes and ears to detect them. And then we have working groups that we work with to collaborate and coordinate on the studies that need to be done to answer those questions that I just posed. Mm -hmm. So we look at the epidemiology, you know, is there a, a rapid increase when we wouldn't expect it? Um, do we see something in, in, in lethality? Um, and do our diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines work? So the big question is, as you said, does my vaccine work? Yeah. So for the four variants of concern that we are tracking so far with the information that we have, and I say so far because this is a rapidly changing, it, it's right. fast and furious, it's, it's every day. Um, you know, so far, our public health and social measures work. The, vir the virus is spread the same way. Uh, we know what we need to do to protect ourselves and to prevent the spread. Our diagnostics still work. Our therapeutics still work, although there's some question of some of the monoclonal antibodies, hmm. and our vaccines still protect against severe disease and death. This is important. So anyone that's out there that's listening, when it's your turn, get the vaccine. This is very, very important, yeah. but we will continue to study. So anything that changes with that, we will inform. Um, and then there may be, what worries me, what your question was, what worries me is that um, we could come to a point where a variant emerges that will evade our vaccines. And we need to be in a good position to be able to anticipate this. And this is what we're trying to do by looking at specific mutations and constellation of mutations to inform vaccine composition. So we are thinking about that ahead of time and working with manufacturers and regulators around this space so that we can anticipate that this might happen at some point. We just mm -hmm. need to be ready. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Van Kerkhove, uh, you know, Good news, we have a vaccine that's effective. Good news, we're ramping up production and, and now we're seeing uh, certainly President Biden's uh, recommendation around lifting the intellectual property restrictions to accelerate production around the world. And we know COVAX is doing its very best to get vaccine out there. Here in the United States, as you know, demand really beginning to fall off. You know, we saw this huge surge in demand you know, maybe even a state like the one we live in, you get to 50% higher for some populations, but some plateauing going on. And across the globe, I think childhood immunizations in particular over these last 10, 15, 20 years has been a huge success story uh, in terms of our efforts to eradicate disease. Are we hearing the same messages of hesitancy and resistance to taking the vaccine in countries around the globe that we're hearing here in the United States? I mean, these are countries who in the last generation or two 
have seen what it means to really get a handle on, on childhood diseases like measles that we thought we might never get a handle on. Are we seeing resistance to the COVID vaccine in all countries? Well, in fact, what we are seeing is many countries are asking for this vaccine, yeah. begging for this vaccine. And what we're not seeing is the sharing of the vaccine around the world. So through COVAX and, and with our partnerships, uh, we are trying to work towards vaccinating those who are most risk around the world. So they're health workers and people of advanced age, people who have underlying conditions. And we don't see those vaccines reaching all countries. We need everyone in every country who is at risk to receive that vaccine, mm -hmm. as opposed to everyone in only a couple of countries. Having said that, of course, there is vaccine hesitancy and there are questions that people are asking, rightly so. You know, we hear a lot about how fast, you know, these vaccines have been developed. But really, I mean, these have been developed over decades with investments and, and science. I mean, science has really delivered. So on day one, you know, when we learned of this cluster of pneumonia and when we had the full genome sequence, the, the vaccine production, uh, production uh, development, excuse uh -huh. me, um, really accelerated but we have safe and effective vaccines, um, which is a triumph of science. Now we, what we need to do is to work to understand what is the reason for the hesitancy? You know, what are the questions that people have? What can we answer? How can we work through that? We're doing this through a number of different ways, uh, working with different communities, different youth groups, different religious groups, um, and really trying to get the demand up. Um, but I do have to say, if you look at this on a global level, it's the opposite. Yeah. We see the majority of the world who want this yeah. vaccine, who don't yet have access. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, mm -hmm. of a rephrasing and a reshift. Yeah. Um, and that's what we need to work on. We're speaking today with Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, uh, COVID-19 technical lead at the WHO. She's an infectious disease epidemiologist at WHO's World uh, Health Emergency Program. You know, you have such a, a great job in we are so uh, pleased to have you today and have been following your work, but you also had an interesting perch as being one of the uh, few scientists that were allowed to travel to Wuhan, China, early uh, as the co coronavirus first emerged back in February of last year, uh, when so much was unknown. And obviously there's been a lot of concern over whether observers were given adequate access to the scientific data. But I also think that uh, WHO is, is trying to figure out how to improve the pandemic surveillance system, trying to take lessons learned from whatever happened back in February in Wuhan or wherever it came from, and trying to build this uh, more global, uh, collaborative, uh, transparent and efficient uh, communication model uh, between all countries. Tell us a little bit about that work, because it's so important to our long-term success. Yeah, I mean, how, mu how much time do you have? I mean, we can spend the next <laughs> That's 10 right. days You're going to write a number this. of papers on this, I know, but uh, give us a high no, overview. No, it's just, it, but I, you know, what you're talking about and sort of sort of learning from this, like every, every instance of this is an opportunity to learn to do better. I mean, we know that most viruses, emerging, re-emerging viruses, pathogens are zoonotic. They come from animals. Um, there are many different pathogens that circulate in wildlife, in bats, for example. Mm -hmm. um, some of these viruses spill over, what we call spill over. They transmit between an animal to a human, sometimes between an intermediate host. And so most of my, my professional life has been around emerging and re-emerging diseases, and really around that time of emergence. When there is a spillover, how do we detect that rapidly? So part of the surveillance is not just in humans, it's in the animals themselves. So we work with agencies like FAO and OIE um, to be able to have better surveillance in wildlife, but also in domestic animals. Um, and there are certain species that you know we look, we pay more attention to, like bats, for example, um, because we know coronaviruses, many, many different coronaviruses circulate in bats. But what are the factors? What are the characteristics um, that result in a spillover event? And that's what many, many people are working on to be able to understand those factors so that we can be at a, in a better position to detect them rapidly. And then in many situations, um, do some early investigations, rapid response, outbreak investigation. My whole career has been on outbreak investigation mm -hmm. and it was done under this one health approach 
before it was even called One Health. It just meant multidisciplinary. You worked with veterinarians, you worked with clinicians, you worked with community leaders and the village chief. Um, and the surveillance needs to improve, but it's not only the surveillance, it's the alert system. When something is out of or the ordinary, um, how does that get reported? How does that sample get taken? And then we have a diagnostic that is done to be able to determine, is it something that we expect or is it something truly novel? And then how do we raise that alert up from a district level, for example, all the way up through national? What normally happens in these types of situations is that you have um, an individual who is infected, who's, who's diseased, who's sick, and you have an astute medical profession, professional, a, clin a clinician, a nurse, that notices something out of the ordinary, and that's how it gets detected. Mm. SARS, MERS, mm. even this um, novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Yeah. But we, what we want to do is move that back. Instead of it being detected before people when they're when they're diseased, there could be a lot of small spillover events that gets missed. So um, there's a lot that's happening in surveillance. Um, there's a lot happening in terms of the information systems that are necessary to pick up those alerts. Um, there's a lot that's happening in diagnostics and early detection in country. And if that doesn't happen, how do we share those samples rapidly, um, you know, to be able to support um, uh, sequencing and sequencing has changed the game. I mean, in the last um, few years, the ability to do a full genome sequence mm -hmm. rapidly kickstarts diagnostic development, therapeutics mm -hmm. and vaccines. Whereas in you know a few years back, this would take years to happen. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot in this space and it's about partnership. It's about a one health approach. Yeah. Um, and it's about, um, you know, really starting from the ground up, not from international down. We have a lot of international will, um, and it's using those partnerships strategically, wisely, and and you know, and getting that best system that's out there. But it's a work in progress. Yeah. Um, it will take time, uh, but I I'm hopeful, you know, that we're moving in the right direction. Great. Well, Dr. Baron Kirkhoff, I think you may actually uh, be describing what I wanted to ask you about that I've been reading about, which is the World Health Organization's new initiative called the uh, World Health Organization Hub this global collaboration of countries, worldwide partners, to do all the things that you're talking about, uh, new systems to link data as it's coming in from many and diverse places, to do the analysis, yeah. monitor disease outbreak and control measures around the country. I don't know how uh, immediately you're engaged in that work, but we'd love for our listeners to have a chance uh, to hear about this. And I, I think one of uh, the things we've really tried to do this year is just make clear to the world to our listeners, um, how how much is going on all the time to try and really protect uh, the health of people around the globe? So just share with us a little bit about this this hub. Yes, so there are several different initiatives that are underway that are being enhanced, that are being established. So you know when 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 a pandemic happens, when a big outbreak happens, everybody thinks, okay, what do we need to do new? How do we start from scratch? But what we really want to do is enhance and 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 nurture the systems that exist and make them better. Um, there are a number of different initiatives underway. Um, we have this system called EIOS, the Epidemic, uh, Epidemic Intelligence from Open Sources, which is a way to pull in information um, around, the, around the world electronically, um, digitally, different languages right, and rumors and systems. We've just announced a couple of different things. One is this Berlin hub. I don't know if you're referring to the Berlin hub or the bio hub because these are different these are different initiatives in the berlin hub of what we're doing is pulling together um, ways in which we can um, have more rapid information sharing and there can be some innovations around pulling together information uh, signals that may be existing how that could be rapidly analyzed and used for public health decision making the bio hub is an initiative it's the volunteer basis of countries to be able to share specimens hmm in labs around the world so that rapid detection can be made, rapid um, analysis and sequencing can be made to determine what is it. You know, one of the, the, one of the five big questions we ask at the beginning of any outbreak is, what is it? How does it spread? Who is it infecting? How much has it circulated so far? And what do we do to stop it? Mm -hmm. And this what is it is, mm -hmm. is a really critical, maybe it sounds um, like an easy thing to do, yeah. but in most parts of the world, that's very, very difficult to do. So the biohub is a way in which samples can be shared with a lab 
Um, and we hope to have many different labs around the world that can accept these types of samples and do some really rapid sequencing analysis to be able to say, it's this, it's that, it's not a coronavirus, it's not influenza, it's not, and then say what it might be. Mm -hmm. And so there's several different initiatives that are underway and it's working with our member states to be able to share those samples and so that we can release that information uh, to everyone around the world for action. Great. Let me get one last question in here. And uh, I was thinking as you were talking about uh, One Health and working, the medical teams working with the village leader as well. I was thinking about the work that we do in community health centers uh, in this country, reaching underserved populations, making sure that we include everyone and uh, working with the, with, the, with the local leaders. Uh, and those are the communities that have uh, uh, borne the brunt of this outbreak uh, uh, here, at least in the States that I know around the country, around the globe as well. What, what other countries are relying on during the COVID? What, what are you seeing in terms of strategies that are working with special populations using community health workers or other strategies? Uh, what's been an effective uh, tool in terms of reaching vulnerable populations? I mean, exactly as you point out, you know, working at the community level, engagement, um, you know, direct engagement is is what works. Um, there isn't a magic solution here. It's, it takes time. It takes effort. Um, and what we've seen with vulnerable populations is um, finding the right community leaders to be working with, yep. tailoring the approach to what we do. So at WHO, we develop global guidance. Um, and, and it's meant to serve all of our member states around the world in every single context. But for specific vulnerable populations and in living in certain types of conditions, it needs to be tailored. It needs to be adaptable to the local context to make sure that it is achievable, implementable. It doesn't change the goal, but it means we have to work that much harder to make sure that it can be implemented. It's about engagement and it's a constant engagement and having um, communities be part of the solution. So instead of going into a community and say, here is the solution, you know, figure this out yourself, it's working with them directly. We spend a lot of time engaging with many different groups around the world, different sectors, different vulnerable populations. You know, this pandemic um, has really highlighted inequities um, that existed far before this, but has really exacerbated them. And I do see much more attention to this. I do see uh, a renewed attention to this. I hope we can progress this. So that we really get to some of the fundamental issues that COVID has just, you know, exposed again. Um, but it's about a constant um, two-way. Mm -hmm. And for us, what we see is uh, through community engagement, it's about trust. Um, it's about um, making sure that they don't that they are part of the solution uh, with us. And so. It isn't, a, it isn't a short answer. It is a one solution fits yeah. all. I mean, I, I should probably turn the question back to you and you can tell me what works <laughs> best. But, mm -hmm. you know, we, we just, we work through our regional offices and our country offices to ensure that what we do as an organization to, to keep people safe, reach everyone everywhere in mm -hmm. the settings that they live in, with the conditions that they have, with the capacities to be able to respond and to deliver healthcare. Um, and so it, it is a work in progress um, it, it requires investment, it, it financial investment, resources, um, and a continued um, willingness to adapt as necessary. We've been speaking today with Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, the COVID-19 technical lead at the World Health Organization. Dr. Van Kerkhove, we want to thank you for being such a clear and compelling communicator of expert knowledge during this incredible global crisis and for your commitment to science and to seeking out the answers that will help keep our world safe going forward. Thank you for all you've done to confront this deadly pandemic. And thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us today on Conversations on Healthcare. Thank you so much.